It seems like no two years are alike, which is what makes winter nutrition for our cows a moving target. As those forages senesce and mature, that protein starts to decline in those those pastures. And so then we start to worry more about the protein side of things. That's Dr. Megan Van Emmen, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist at Montana State University. Also joining us will be Dr. Eric Bailey, Beef Extension Specialist from the University of Missouri. You know, when we get into feeding some of these sort of I don't want to call them emergency forages, but certainly not the not the highest quality yeah. stuff that we have on hand. You know, that's when it becomes important to make sure you've got a, a, a mineral program that the cows are consuming consistently. We're talking winter cow nutrition from the winter ranges in the west to those on fall fescue in the Midwest and the eastern seaboard down to the droughted regions of the southern plains on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. everyone and we welcome you here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're glad to have you joining us on our program today and boy oh boy do we have a lot to cover here today. So I'm not going to really dilly dally around with a lot of extra things. As you heard in the opening Dr. Eric Bailey out of the University of Missouri and Dr. Megan Van Emmen out of Montana State University will be joining us to talk about winter cow nutrition. Yeah we got a, we got a lot of different folks across the region. Not every winter cow plan is a cookie cutter deal and so that's why I brought in a couple different folks to give us some representation from different parts of the country. So that's what our featured topic here is today. Also, Dane Cooper, who is head of sales and strategy with Zoetta, is going to be joining us here in just a moment. As we're going to be talking about some genetic testing that he recently done on a set of heifers that he bought and how he was able to utilize that information in in terms of looking and making those replacements. Really interesting information there. Join us for that. And then, of course, as we always do, meteorologists. Meteorologist Don Day will join us at the very end of our program today. But today, while we're going to be talking long-term weather, we're talking really long-term because he's going to answer this question. Do volcanoes affect our climate and weather? That's the question he's going to answer here today. A quick thank you to our sponsors here today. Zenpro, Avela 4. Allow your cows and calves to perform to their full potential with Zenpro, Avela 4. And the American Simmental Association, you know, between 2014 and 20, there was a survey done that showed one of the largest growth in bull breeds during that time was bulls with sem genetics the reason for it because heterosis works which is why with simmental it's more per head period find out more at simmental.org performance ranch don't keep your cow calf herd data in a notebook keep it in a cloud with performance ranch find out more performance livestock analytics.com and gain smart mineral by biozyme increase pasture utilization with the ama firm advantage found in all gain smart minerals find out more at gainsmart.com well let's check in with the captain now for this week's edition of tim's two cents hey justin hey everybody out there in working ranch radio land grab your november december 2022 issue of working ranch magazine i want you guys to turn faithfully to page 76 and this very timely article is called audit Got it. And this is by Paul Baraluch and Aya Kanda, and they are tax law professionals. They submitted this great article to us, and uh, the subheading is, if you're making a profit on cows, and before the IRS starts circling the ranch, consider this advice. Now, I'll tell you what, this article on page 76 of the November-December 2022 Working Ranch is absolutely a must-read it's going to lay out a bunch of things uh, very clearly for uh, you loyal listeners that you probably should have known, but maybe you just needed an article like this to kind of nail it down. And we highlighted a few things we like to highlight in the magazine so you don't have to chase these take-home messages down. Check it out. And Justin, tell the listeners about your Kent Rollins Cowboy Coffee uh, I guess epiphany. Back to you. 
right. Well, folks, here's the deal. A couple of weeks ago, it was episode 94. Kent Rollins joined us here on the program, Cowboy Cook and Chef. Uh, also, he has his YouTube channel that's out there. And he was telling us that one of his most downloaded videos was making cowboy coffee. Now, we all know what cowboy coffee is and essentially how you make it. But he had certain ways you kind of do certain things, certain times and, and so forth. And very good instructional video. And so for the last two weeks, I have been doing that. Well, this morning, I got in a hurry and needed to make a quick cup of coffee. So I just went ahead and made a regular uh, pot out of my old coffee maker. Oh, my word, it was disgusting. And so all of needless to say is that I kind of got hooked on cowboy coffee. So tomorrow morning, I'll know what I'll be doing for coffee in the morning. So that's the story on that. By the way, go check that episode out, episode 94 with Kent Rollins. Well, before we head to break, I want to remind you coming up in our next segment, we're going to be talking genetic testing on those replacement heifers. And then following that, we're talking winter cow nutrition. And speaking of that, you know, New Generation Supplements is celebrating their 20th year in business this year. Yeah, those folks have been around a while. They have over 2,000 dealerships across the U.S. and Canada. Now, I'm not saying that to blow your hair back or try to make you feel like they're some big mega feed company because the reality is, is that they know that raising cattle in places like West Texas or up in South Dakota or over uh, down in Missouri, different places, it's different, which is why they have over 70 unique formulas between their three livestock brands. Those are Smart Lick, Feed in a Drum, and Mega Lick. They're not a fad-based company. They've been around a while and they only sell what is proven to improve cattle performance and help animals reach their genetic potential. Check them out. New Generation Supplements, research-driven, field-proven supplement solution. Find out more at newgensupplements.com. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to be talking genetic testing on those replacement heifers when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to PerformanceLivestockAnalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. Well, joining me now is Dane Cooper. He's the head of sales and strategy with Zoetis Precision Animal Health and also founder of Performance Livestock Analytics. And Dane, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Yeah, pleasure to join you, Justin. Well, Dane, real quick, before we get into our topic here on genetic testing, uh, you and I were talking at the break about Performance Livestock Analytics because that was a, a company that you started and, and then Zoetis bought that from you. Yeah, that's right. You know, Performance Beef has really been known as the platform to go to for a for a commercial producer that's in the feedlot. You know, and people just love using it. And, you know, the ranch cow-calf guy, we never were able to get to um, – just because we didn't have the functionality specifically for them. And so we're excited to be launching Performance Ranch uh, first of the coming year here commercially for the cow-calf producer to provide in that same experience that the feedlot producers love, but with an interface and that data documentation and everything that, that they need on their farm. So we're, we're excited for that coming out here, and I think it'll – to really help the commercial cow calf producer. You bet. And uh, and again, I know we're, we're a little off track of what uh, initially we have you out here to talk about today, uh, Dane, and in, in regards to genetic testing. But uh, nevertheless, I thought as you and I were talking, some of that information we were talking about was very informative for me, uh, being a producer rancher myself. And I thought it would just be good to pass that information along to other folks as well. So now let's jump back on track and let's talk a little bit about you know this time of the year we're weaning calves or we're, we're looking at these next set of, of cattle that could be inputted into our herd. So it's very, yeah. very important that we're finding cattle that we know are going to function and are going to work. We know that one of the biggest costs to producers out there is the fact that we have cows not staying in the herd very long. And so if there are tools, which we're going to talk about, we've talked about before here on our program, that we can use to help us dial down and drill down into our herd uh, to find cattle, find these replacements that are going to fit our environment, that can be top performers in our herd, that is something we need to seriously be looking at, mainly from an aspect of long-term profitability. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. I think, you know, 
we've been integrated with Zoetis now. You know, they bought bought my business, PLA, two and a half years ago. And we've been integrated with a genetics team. And I was personally pretty naive, right? I'm an Iowa farm kid, you know, have a feedlot, um, enjoy cow-calf. But I didn't, really didn't know how genetic testing worked or really even that it was available through Zoetis. And so for me, the best way to learn is to to get a real world experience. Um, and so I just just went through that, you know, I, I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a set of commercial heifers, get them genetically tested and and kind of see it from my own, my own view versus, versus a Zoetis view. Right. And so um, I just got the data on that probably a month ago and it was so interesting, right. I have worked with several order buyers that I know from a feedlot perspective. And um, I said, Hey, best set of heifers you can buy me 7,500 head, whatever, let's buy them get them tested, get them AI. And, you know, they plan on selling them as, as bred heifers. And so months ago, I got the call, mm -hmm. the best set of heifers that walk in the ring and like, you got to own these. And right. And I'm like, well, what are they going to cost? Well, you know, they give you an estimate, but of course they always cost more than, yeah. than, than what, what they should or what they said they were going to. And so, but they were the group, right. As advertised from a ranch that had such a reputation that were the best looking set of heifers you could get. So I'm like, well, let's, let's go on this journey and do this. And so bought them, had them, had them genetically tested and, and was able to see the data for myself. So from that, you say it was a reputation herd, a lot of great yep. breeding that, you know, you're told that, okay, here's, here's the top notch out there. What, what would you, what'd you find on that? So here, here's the data, right? And so that there in fact are some very elite animals in there. And so Zoetis has a couple different combined scores, right? You get it, you get an index, you get 16 different indexes out of this genetic test, but they have this scores of Zoetis total return, Zoetis cow calf score and the Zoetis feedlot carcass rank, right? And so um, really the total return just kind of combines everything from a commercial cow, cow value and it's in its growth and carcass merits it would pass on as well. Right. And so, you know, I have I have animals, right? The Zoetis, I believe, database has over 1.2 million animals in it. And so what I found out is that on average, the animals combined rank in the top 39% of the total rank. Okay. So I'm happy to report that I did buy <laughs> better than average animals by 11%, right? Mm -hmm. But what's crazy, and, it, and I feel like this is such a thing for a commercial cow-calf producer, is that you're always going to be buying animals that are represented as X, right? But you're always going to be buying the curve, right? You're going to have animals in there that are the front end of the curve, yeah. the middle and the back end of the curve. It's just, you hope you have more of them on the front end, but you know, so I have several animals that ended up in the top two, three, four, 10% of the total database, some super elite animals that are in the top 1% for weaning weight rank, um, milk and ability and, and intermuscular fat. So IMF top 1%, weaning weight rank top 1%, and then the, the maternal also everything from a teat nutter score, uh, milk rank was all in the top 10%. So like this is an animal, this 5826 I'm looking at is elite, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then I scroll to the bottom of it and I have, just looking now, I have over seven animals that are in the bottom 90% of the database, oh, right? Wow. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm like, it's, this is such a reality. Is it like I bought, I sat here and waited to buy the best set of heifers that could have been represented and sold to me that I thought, but you, but you still don't know. Right. And it's like, dang, that's, that's just yeah. a reality. I think if anyone, whether they're keeping their own commercial heifers, you know, these are the ones that most visually look like they're the best and maybe came out yeah. of that, what they thought were the best cows. And that, you know, if I really want to improve what I'm doing and have the have an elite set of heifers that like the twenty nine dollar genetic test is just such a no brainer. Because if I can eliminate these bottom 15 animals that are in the bottom 75 percent of the database, like a six dollar 50 cent corn, you're raising them to, you know, you got two years out of this animal for it produces a calf that puts dollars in the pocket. And it's like the value in return is such a no brainer. The reality is, is that. I was able to sneak some pretty crazy elite heifers out of this guy's herd as well. Yeah, yeah. And he took probably 10, 20, 30 years. So if they're not genetically testing, the reality is they're letting some of the, probably their most elite EPD animals out of the herd as well without even knowing it, right? Yeah. Um, so it's 
it's just some crazy interesting yeah. data, you know, and it feels like to me when I got the numbers and I'm like, of course, this is this is the reality of like whether it's me buying commercial heifers or someone else is like this is what you get. You are going to get top end, middle and bottom end. And it's like, how do you eliminate that bottom end? Yeah. Like the reality, as much as I'm excited about those top 2% animals, the reality is, is that I am feeding heifers right now, still have them, that are in the bottom 90% combined, whether it's milking, growth, carcass merit, that those animals should not be kept as replacements, AI'd, and be in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is, you were talking about that and you were saying, you know, those low end ones and those high end ones, phenotypically, were you seeing a big, that big of a difference between that high end to the bottom end? They look the same. I mean, you could not sort these animals if you had to. Uh So like the buyer that, that represented them to me to when I bought them sight unseen was correct. They were like peas in the pod. They were just such nice looking foundational females like you could not you could not separate a single one of them out at all you know that's your use the the cowboy intuition Mm -hmm. you know i don't think it's a situation where it's like hey cow calf producers replace what you normally do of your best cows your best animals but like the using this genetic testing alongside how it phenotypically looks is a no-brainer like use it alongside what you're doing don't don't say hey you got to go replace what you do but but use it alongside what you do you know what i mean is that they need to look correct as well in the way they walk foundationally their structure but they should have the the top genetic scores as well you know good looking animal that's that's in the bottom 90 percent probably shouldn't stay in the herd right and so the cost of that test for an animal that you could be keeping 10 years is such a Mm no-brainer um to to use this technology on your farm you bet so if if guys are wanting more information on this wh- where would they head yeah i think there's there's a there's a, actually a cool tool on a website it's called it's selectwithgenetics.com so selectwithgenetics.com and you can actually play a quick game right we're going to show you four animals and you can select which ones you think are the best genetically um and you can kind of see it put in your information and then enter for a chance to win a free vaccine cooler so kind of play the game and see how it works real time. Um, and then you can go there to get more information as well. Well, win a free cooler. So they just did this at the Angus convention and it's still available um, to win a free cooler. So I think it's, mm-hmm. it's probably the best place to go to check it out right now. All right. Well, Dane, I do appreciate you joining us here on the working ranch radio show, sharing with us uh, a little bit more about genetic testing and also appreciate your firsthand knowledge on it as well. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And again, that website that Dane was mentioned a little bit ago where you can go do that keep and coal class there, that is selectwithgenetics.com. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to be talking winter cow nutrition. Yeah, it's been cold across the country. It's time to get locked down and get it figured out. We'll be back with more on that when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to PerformanceLivestockAnalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. Cattle producers, here's a way to put more dollars in your pocket. Put the Amifirm advantage found in all Gain Smart Mineral to work in your cow herd. Amifirm is the industry leader in increasing fiber digestion. In fact, research shows putting Amifirm to work increases forage utilization by 10%, reducing overall forage costs and allowing you to graze more animals per acre. That's a big time return on your investment. To find which Gain Smart Mineral formula is right for your herd, visit GainSmart.com. 
And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills as we head now into our, our featured interview. And joining us today will be a couple guests as we talk on winter cow nutrition. With all this cold weather across the country that we've been experiencing the last couple of weeks, definitely something on the top of our minds. So Dr. Eric Bailey is with us today. He's a beef extension specialist from the University of Missouri. And Dr. Bailey, thanks for joining us here. Good morning, Justin. Thanks for having me on. Also joining us is Dr. Megan Van Emmen. She is the Associate Professor, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist at Fort Keogh uh, for Montana State University. And uh, Dr. Van Emmen, thanks for joining us as well. All right. Well, thanks, Justin. And hopefully we get a little bit of a warm up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. One of the reasons I've got folks from two kind of distinctly different parts of the country uh, and, and in general, th- probably one can can answer a lot of our questions here today about general cow nutrition as we head into the winter time. But I thought uh, Dr. Bailey uh, coming out of the University of Missouri can can answer some questions in regards to that element of the country and Dr. Van Emmen uh, more on the range side of things as she finds herself on the Great Plains uh, of eastern Montana there at Fort Keogh. But uh, folks, uh, for, for both of my guests here today, and, and I guess we'll just start with how I introduce them, uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, when we look at winter cow nutrition, fundamentally, maybe this is just a, a wide uh, across the board, what's maybe some of the most top things that we need to be thinking about? Well, that's a great question, Justin, and I'm going to use a little bit of my experience. So I grew up on a cow-calf operation in northeastern New Mexico and to, to help draw the contrast between um, what Dr. Van Amen's probably going to cover more so and what I'll cover more on my end. You know, where I grew up, we graze 365 days a year. We typically would supplement protein starting in December, January, and, you know, very little hay is fed. Since I've come to Missouri, what has changed and what I've had to learn about is, you know, a completely different forage system where we're heavily reliant upon feeding stored forages during the wintertime. At least that's the culture that a lot of folks use here. I would say that in Missouri, I think a lot about getting enough calories, enough energy into a beef cow. That really becomes our our first limiting nutrient in a lot of respects where whereas you know out west it typically and and a lot of trade publications will say this that you know protein is the first limiting nutrient with low quality forages during the winter time yeah that's a good point uh dr van emmons just to add to that uh, as as i said you know you're out of kind of the mile city area of eastern montana at they're stationed at fort keogh and so uh, when you look at that from a perspective, the top things that you think about when advising folks and they're looking at winter cow nutrition? Well, that's that's that hard question of, of where do we go. But um, no, I think the biggest one that we worry about is protein. You know, we get those uh, forages on the pasture that start to senesce, you know, depending, I, I should say, depending on the uh, precipitation we receive. Um, for the year, luckily, in a lot of the parts of our state, you know, we received some good moisture this year, so we were able to graze probably a little bit longer than we normally would compared to the last couple of years. But um, as those forages senesce and mature, that protein starts to decline in those those pastures, and so then we start to worry more about the protein side of things, and so providing some sort of supplement. And, you know, I'm kind of a what, whatever works best for you. Um, late labor is the big one, right, for, for not only here but everywhere. And what's the easiest to feed? So, you know, providing some of those harvested forages, whether it's an alfalfa or grass hay or, or even just some lick tubs or some cow cake. Mm-hmm. Dr. Bailey, because I'm also out of more of the range side of things, it, that is a little different for me. You said specifically one of the things I had to really focus on was calories. So for those folks, that have uh, the abundance of of the matter, the, the dry matter there and needing to focus on calories, what's the first steps in that? Well, so, uh, you know, we grow more grass than we know what to do with for about 60 days in the spring here in Missouri. And we harvest significant amounts of, of hay from our our pastures and also from lands that we we don't have fenced or set up for grazing. Um, you know, it's pretty common for this time of year folks to be sending hay samples in for analysis, and they'll come back to be between 8 and 10% crude protein, yet be over 70% neutral detergent fiber and have a total digestible nutrients, which is what we use as our proxy for energy, mm-hmm. of around 50. And so, 
you know, we often will see folks that will be using commodity feedstuffs like corn gluten pellets, dried distillers grains, you know, even some corn in some places blended in maybe with some soybean hulls. There's a wide variety of, of supplements that, that we'll use. And we're typically going to shoot to supplement them somewhere in the neighborhood of about half a percent of a cow's body weight per day. Um, we also have the challenge here in Missouri where a lot of folks will have both spring and fall calving and, you know, the nutrient requirements of the spring versus the fall calver couldn't be any more different about this time of year where we're in peak lactation and peak nutrient requirements for those fall calving cows. Whereas the <laughs> spring calving cows that we wean to calf on, you know, we're, we're really, their nutrient requirements are about as low as they're going to get throughout the course of the year. So, so I'm, you know, I'm telling folks they got fall cows right now, to, you know, that it's probably, like I said, about half a percent of their body weight per day in a, in a high energy concentrate type supplement to go along with their, their high crude protein, but low energy, uh, mm -hmm. all fescue hay. Dr. Van Emmen, as he was talking about how they supplement for calories, you touched a little bit on, on the supplement for, for protein, which is what typically has to do uh, out in the, in the plain state or the range states. Um, so with that, from a standpoint, when you're looking at that, what should we be targeting? I know one of the things we've talked about in past podcasts that I've had was, you know, really getting a good test on that. Hey, but then what's our target that we need to be looking at? Keeping in mind, this all costs money. So we need to do this on a low cost budget. Right. Yeah, that's that's the hard part. So um, one of the things to look at, you know, definitely, obviously, test your hay, you know, so myself or your local extension agent can put together a good mixed ration for you. Um, that's kind of where I'm I'm sitting at right now. Um, had a lot of questions the last few days about, you know, I've got these different feeds I, that are sitting in the yard and how do I effectively feed those at the lowest cost I can while still meeting all those requirements. So yeah. Um, one of the big things I look at is, you know, anything below about 7% protein um, is what we consider a low quality forage. And we're going to really have to start looking at that protein supplement. Um, really for cows getting towards late gestation here. And I mean, I know we're kind of in November, but as this weather starts to turn and I mean, I'm going to hopefully say we're going to get a little bit warmer, but you never know. <laughs> um, we're probably in that you know, 8% protein needed diet, you know, maybe about 53, 54% TDN or energy for those cows. And then um, closer to, you know, calving time, really getting in the last 60 days prior to calving, we're probably in that 9 to 10% protein range, 54, 55% TDN needs. And then obviously calving, you know, lactation is a huge demand on those calories and that protein of that cow. So, really probably closer to that 10, 11% protein diet and, um, you know, 56, 57% TDN. So a lot of our hays actually do meet those requirements. Um, so that's where strategically using, you know, something like a high quality alfalfa and then blending that with a lower quality forage um, can really, you know, prolong that use of, of that haystack while still meeting all those cows requirements. And those are for cows in good body conditions. So looking at things like that and just monitoring body condition can really help you to determine if you're meeting those cows needs every day. Mm -hmm. Well, I think let's take a quick break here. Uh, folks, our subject today that we're talking is on winter cow nutrition. My guests are Dr. Eric Bailey. He's the beef extension specialist out of the University of Missouri. Also is Dr. Megan Van Emmen. She's the extension beef cattle specialist for Montana State University. And I purposely have folks from different parts of the country on today to talk about winter cow nutrition because I do know there are some variations to that a little bit. One of those, such as fall fescue. And when we come back, we're going to be talking more more about that in addition to addressing uh, the topic on minerals and vitamins and their cruciality to that winter cow nutrition program as well so stay with us we'll be back on the working ranch radio show after this Set up the next generation for a productive lifetime with Zinpro Avela 4. Achieve productive success in your cows with 20% increased conception rate and a 16-day tighter calving interval. Calves from cows supplemented with Zinpro hit the ground running with improved immunity and 28 more pounds at weaning. Allow your cows and calves to perform to their full potential with Zinpro Avela 4. 
And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. Our main topic here we're talking on today is on winter cow nutrition. And I have two guests joining us today to give us a couple different perspectives. First, of course, was Dr. Megan Van Emmen, who is with Montana State University as their beef cattle extension specialist, giving us kind of that Western perspective on winter cow nutrition. And also joining us is Dr. Eric Bailey, who's a beef extension specialist for the University of Missouri. Now, Dr. Bailey, I want to go back to you uh, real quick because before the break you were talking about wintering on fall fescue and the fact that states like like Missouri and there's others your surrounding states there and in fact uh, down south of you and even out in the eastern seaboard that have the ability to grow a lot of grass and wintering on fall fescue is kind of a a topic that uh, you have to deal with quite a bit. So in in Missouri, we're we're fortunate. Our primary forage tall fescue actually has two growth periods in the year. We get you know a, a flush of, of growth in April, May, and June, and then it'll go dormant during July, August, and into September. And then we'll later part of September into October and November we'll actually get additional forage grown. Now it's not the same quantity as we get in the spring. We typically tell folks we get about two thirds in the spring, one third in the in the fall. But a lot a, a tried and true strategy to reduce the number of days that we feed hay in the wintertime is to actually come in and fertilize pastures in August, defer grazing off of them in, in September, October, and then turn cattle out to graze this stockpiled fescue, you know, into November, December, and, and January. And back to Dr. Van Amen's discussion earlier about nutrient requirements, the quality of the stockpile fescue will be in excess of the nutrient requirements of even a, a lactating fall calving cow. It'll be above 12% crude protein. It'll be above 60% TDN. It's an excellent feed resource that I strongly encourage folks in that part of the country to take advantage of because it it simply can't be beat in terms of, of cost per you know, pound of forage when you compare it to stored forages, you know, even when you count the fertilizer cost, it, it's it's a wonderful feedstuff. You know, the only challenge that comes with it are in years like this year where we've been dry in Missouri since about the first of June. I think we have some we have a lot of pastures across the state that the the yield of the stockpile is down. And so folks are are into their hay supplies already, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Dr. Van Emmen, I want to go a, a direction here with you as as we look at this time of the year. And I want to talk a little bit about the minerals and the vitamin element that needs to come in uh, at some point in our uh, in our programs. And as I was talking to both you guys during the break and I expressing, you know, that I'm, I'm kind of a lot low input operator here. I don't like to put a lot of extra costs in our cattle if we can help it. But there are some things that we need to be looking looking at does minerals and vitamins fall into that category oh absolutely um you know i'm a big proponent and supporter of of having a good quality vitamin and mineral program um i'm kind of also one of those i don't really care how you get them into the cows um, whether that's a loose supplement a lick tub you know whatever you're feeding but just making sure they're meeting those requirements uh, for for each of the minerals especially our trace minerals um, the big four, copper, zinc, uh, manganese, and selenium, because they're so important for fetal development. You know, we're getting into the winter time when forages, at least on the pasture, aren't the best quality, which means your minerals are also down. Um, but luckily, you know, even with our harvested forages, if it's a decent quality, they usually have pretty good mineral and minerals and vitamins. So it's one thing I like to support and and. A lot of times it's not necessarily um, you'll see the, you know, the advantage tomorrow. It's an insurance policy for for later on in the season as we move into what I call higher stress events. You know, um, it snowed early this season. Um, We were talking a little bit in the break about some sick calves at weaning Mm -hmm. time. And, you know, we've experienced that here. We had an early snow. Guys hadn't bought, brought their cows and calves in yet for weaning time, and and that's a, just a high stress event, and that's a good time when minerals and vitamins play a huge role in that immune system. Mm-hmm. You bet. So, yeah, I, I I always support that, but unfortunately, it's also very expensive, and it's something always have to you always have to consider when you're feeding those cows um, through the winter time and and what that expense is. Mm-hmm. You bet. Dr. Bailey, just some additional comments from you on the vitamins or mineral packages. 
I'm with you, Justin. I'm a, I'm a pretty low input guy when it comes to minerals and vitamins. You know, it's it's unfortunate that I would tell you that eight out of ten questions that come into my office are about minerals and vitamins, and quite honestly, only one or two out of ten issues truly boils down to minerals and vitamins because oftentimes we see you know overgrazed pastures or really poor quality forage. It, a lot of times, it comes down to protein and energy that that is the true issue that's you know causing body condition score loss or poor reproductive performance or um you know sick calves at weaning at least over in my neck of the woods but i'm i'm a little concerned about minerals and vitamins this winter because there's a lot of hay that i'm seeing that's getting sold right now because we've been in drought um people will typically store hay for two or three years prior to feeding it. And some of this, I've, you know, I'm seeing CRP that's been bailed up and is being marketed. I'm seeing hay that's been stored outside for a couple of years being marketed. You know, when we get into feeding some of these sort of, I don't want to call them emergency forages, but certainly not the, not the highest quality stuff that we have on hand. You know, that's when it becomes important to make sure you've got a, a, a mineral program that the cows are consuming consistently, one that is not just, you know, a salt mix that has, you know, a salt and a little bit of something else, but, it, you know, we'll have both the macro and the micro minerals. And, you know, one thing that people don't recognize is that even some of the lower end trace mineral packages or mineral supplements that have a trace mineral package, oftentimes feed mills formulate those to contain at least 75% of a, of a beef cow's daily requirement for that nutrient just from the supplement. And mm-hmm. so what, what that means is I tell folks to, to really keep track of intake and if they're consuming it well, it's pretty good chance that they're not deficient in one of the, those big four that Dr. Van Amen yeah. discussed. And, you know, on the flip side, I'll run into cases where folks will call me and say that my their 35 cow herd ate a pallet of mineral in a month. What do I do? Again, I'll run into situations like that. And oftentimes it's actually because there's a protein or a energy deficiency that's sort of driving intake. When I run into cases like that, I tell guys to just take the mineral away until the average intake over time levels out because most of these supplements are designed to be consumed at a rate of, you know, four ounces or a quarter pound yeah. per, per head per day. Well, you know, and I think in, in our industry here today, we have a lot of products that are packaged and formulated in ways that are very palatable <laughs> to, to our livestock. And, and I cautious to say this because by no means do I want uh, those that are listening that represent our supplement industry to think that I'm negative towards them it's not the case because they're needed and i need them and that's how i get through utilizing my winter grass every year if i have winter grass but nevertheless the products in such a way can create that ability to over feed these supplements and really in the long run from a profitability standpoint that's not really the best situation you bet i i completely agree it's it's um you know I mean, feed in general, inputs in general have have been out of hand price wise in the last 12 to 18 months. But uh, but yeah, that's that's one area where I, I get concerned because I'll tell you of mineral cases that I've worked here in Missouri. I have never worked one where once I actually got with the producer and tracked their bills and went back I've never seen a case where they weren't feeding at least 2x what the cow would require or offering it. So, mm-hmm. you know, voluntary consumption, oftentimes we need them. We need to slow them down more than we need to get them to eat more of it. Yeah. Well, to both of you, I, I appreciate you joining us. And before I go, I'm going to give both of you some final comments here. And, and as I had introduced you guys earlier from two different areas, really to represent the types of beef producers that we might see in different parts of the country. And so Dr. Van Emmen, I'll go with you first, some final comments. And as you kind of represent the, the range kind of cow out there, uh, ranchers out there, some final comments from you as we look at winter cow nutrition. Ooh, goodness. Um, 
Well, probably the big one is just making sure those cows are in really good condition as, as you come into late gestation, early calving time, um, especially for those producers, especially on the seed stocks side of things that are going to calve here in January, February, you know, the coldest months, at least of our year, as I'm sure you're aware, Justin, mm-hmm. you know, we could get into the 20, 30 belows and, and everything. So just keeping those cows in good condition. And then I know we're, we're kind of focused on the cow right now, but um, also keep and your bulls up and ready to go you know we we want to make sure they're going to pass that breeding soundness exam ne- next year and you know making sure they're they're getting their nutritional needs met as well but um yeah big one just monitor body condition and you know you can make slight adjustments on your feeding regime um, based on that as, as, as those cows maybe lose a little condition or as they gain some body condition as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good comments there. Uh, Dr. Bailey, for you, just some final comments. Uh, again, as as I kind of uh, picked Dr. Van Emmen out of Montana State University here today to, to kind of hit that range cow deal, as as we've said, you're kind of more in the higher precip areas, a little bit different uh, uh, kind of an intake going on there. Some final comments from you as you represent producers in your area. Well, first off, thanks again for having me on. I really appreciated this is this conversation. This has been a good visit. Um, Dr. Van Amen did a really nice job of summarizing, you know, winter cow nutrition from a from a thirty thousand foot view, and I echo all of her comments. Where I want to take my comments though are back towards our current kind of boots on the ground conditions across much of the fescue belt. of the state of Missouri is at least in uh, moderate or worse drought right now, and 87% of the state is is abnormally dry, at least, um, according to the UNL Drought Monitor Mm -hmm. website. What I'm telling folks at extension meetings this fall is that you need to be ready if your hay supply is not secure now is the time to get out on the market and make sure that you have hay to last you till till next April because you know there's a lot of folks that didn't put nitrogen fertilizer down in their hay fields this spring and they got yields that were 30 to 40 percent less than normal. We were abnormally dry starting the first of June and we have not grown near the amount of fall stockpile fescue that we normally do. And so if our spring hay yield was down because fertilizer was very expensive and folks didn't want to spend the money coupled with drought conditions that quite honestly have also been persistent in the southern half of the state for you know throughout the entire growing year you know i am concerned that we are going to wake up at some point past the first of the year and recognize that we don't have enough hay to carry us to spring green up there's still 55 60 dollar bale of hay uh, round bales, four by fives on the market today. There's not been a lot of demand yet, um, according to the Missouri Department of Agriculture. I'm telling folks to really, really count your bales now and 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 make sure you've got enough. I typically tell folks to try to have a bale, a cow per month, and you know try to carry enough to get you to April one pretty comfortably. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's definitely a different dilemma, and, and you guys are experiencing drought. I know, uh, Doctor Van Eman, where you're at up in Montana, you kind of had the uh, kind of two sided coin there. Some some part of Montana had some pretty good spring moisture, and other parts were pretty dry. So when it comes to this, the hay cost of hay and and everything, there's a lot of elements that we're all dealing with. There's no question yep. about that. To both of you, Doctor Eric Bailey with the University of Missouri, Doctor Megan Van Eman with Montana State University. I thank you both for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Well, thanks, Justin, for having me. This was excellent. You bet. Well, one quick thing before we head to the next segment, and that is the utilization of your state beef extension specialists. Most states have them, and I would really encourage you, if you have questions about something that you might not know, and, and shoot, you could have been, you could be ranching for several years, but something might come up and you have a question, give them a call. They're there to help. They have resources. They have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge at their fingertips, and they can help you out. I encourage you to utilize your respective state beef extension specialist we'll stay with us meteorologist don day joins us next as he answers the question do tornadoes affect our climate and weather we'll be back on the working ranch radio show after this Starting off in the right direction is essential to gaining an advantage later when you go to market your calves. And I have proof that the right direction is with Sim Angus Sired Calves. 
A 2020 study by K-State showed that Sim Angus sired steer calves earn more at sale time than all other breed identified sire groups with at least 50 lots represented on Superior Livestock's 2020 summer sales. The proof's right there. For low risk, high potential calves with earning potential, be confident that Sim Genetics will give you more per head, period. Stand strong, Simmental. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. Joining us is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. And we're going to kind of change directions just a little bit, folks. As you know, I've laid out the question of whether or not big volcanoes affect our weather and our climate. So, Don, I'm going to kind of turn that over to you because that was something you touched on on a podcast that you had a week or so ago. Yeah. Let's let's answer the first question, which is do or can volcanoes affect the weather and climate? And, and the answer is, yes, they do, but, and the, and the but is, it really all depends on the strength and the intensity of the eruption. And more importantly, does the eruption get really, really high into the atmosphere? So just having a volcano go off, let's say in, in Iceland or Alaska, doesn't necessarily end up meaning there's a change in the weather. But if it's a very large, energetic, a volcanic eruption that puts a lot of what we call aerosols, that would be volcanic ash, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of um, things like sulfur dioxide, which is a big uh, emitter of in, during volcanic eruptions. That's one thing you get a lot of. And also you get a lot of uh, water vapor if there is a volcano that goes off, especially underwater. If that volcanic eruption gets into the stratosphere, gets above 50,000 feet or higher, then what we have found historically from eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, and Mm -hmm. I think that was around 2000, 2001, there's been historically other big eruptions, even like Mount St. Helens, where we have been able to make a connection between those eruptions and some changes in the weather. And the eruption that happened in the South Pacific, some folks may remember this, it was the Tonga volcano that blew in January of this year. And it was a remarkable eruption. Uh, number one is, I mean, it was, uh, if, if this had happened anywhere close to a populated area, it would have been absolutely devastating. Mm-hmm. But it was an underwater volcano that shot atmos- shot through the atmosphere and got, not only did it reach the stratosphere, it got to the mesosphere, which is the next layer of atmosphere above the stratosphere. You're talking 36 miles. Hmm. That And what is interesting about this is that it happened just south of the equator in the southern hemisphere. The closest area that I could tell you where you could have a geological reference uh, would be northeast of New Zealand. Uh, I mean, we're talking the middle of nowhere where this went off. But what was observed from satellite imagery and, and the satellite sensors that are circling the Earth now more than ever was is that This put a tremendous amount of water into the stratosphere in addition to ash, in addition to sulfur dioxide. Now, why the stratosphere is important, Justin, is is that once things get put into the stratosphere, those uh, ash clouds, Mm -hmm. that sulfur dioxide, that water that goes up there, well, it stays because the atmosphere is very strongly layered And there's very little mixing between the troposphere, which we live in, and the stratosphere. Um, So what happens is whatever gets put up there stays, and then it circles the globe. And what happens is, is whatever stays up there can do two things. It can it can cause cooling because the ash and the sulfur dioxide absorb sunlight and can make the earth cooler in the troposphere. Uh, It can also have a warming effect if there's a lot of water vapor that gets into the stratosphere because that water vapor reflects heat back down to the earth in the troposphere. So you're looking at uh, opposing potential influences during these volcanic eruptions. So what was in the eruption, the water, the sulfur dioxide, Mm -hmm. the other aerosols, plays a big role in how the weather could be impacted. So I know that was a long answer to your question. (laughs) But that's that's basically the thumbnail sketch of of what these volcanic volcanic eruptions can do. Also, I'll throw this in one more mm-hmm. time. 
is, is that it depends on where the volcanoes go off. Higher latitude and lower volcanic eruptions tend to have different impacts as well. Okay, so now we've laid pretty good groundwork there of explaining the impact that we can see due to volcanoes. So let's bring it back to, are we going to see any changes? What's going to happen? The, the, the honest answer to that question is, how will it impact the winter is one, we don't really know. It's not a situation where we could say, well, you know, this is exactly like Pinatubo because it's not or like another eruption. And this is what happened. However, some folks are, are trying to study this and trying to come up with some correlations on historical eruptions that are similar to this and what happened previously. And uh, there's one school of thought that by the atmosphere getting colder, and we, we're being able to measure this, there is a distinct cooling of the of the stratosphere because of this volcanic eruption in the southern hemisphere. And some of that water and ash is now showing up in the northern hemisphere. So we, we have a real-time lab example. What's going on right now, we're observing and we're learning. But if we look at historical volcanic eruptions, somewhat similar to this one, there has been a tendency for what uh, is called the North Atlantic Oscillation to go into a negative phase. And the North Atlantic Oscillation is something we watch in the winter. And it's a way different pressure patterns are distributed across the Northern Hemisphere. And the North Atlantic Oscillation really dictates who has a cold winter and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And we have seen historically, after these large volcanic eruptions, a negative phase to the North Atlantic Oscillation. Now, how does that end up trans? Referring into a forecast on how we might be affected with the weather. <laughs> yeah. Well, North Atlantic oscillations really affect the central and eastern parts of North America and Europe with colder than average winters. So if this volcanic eruption in the South Pacific uh, ends up having an impact in the winter similar to previous situations, well, it's a cold signal, which means uh, this is nobody, nobody wants to hear this. But it could mean a colder than average winter because of this uh, effect on the North Atlantic Oscillation for Central and Eastern United States and Europe. And interestingly enough, here in the last couple of weeks, Justin, the North Atlantic Oscillation has gone from a positive phase to a negative phase. So can we say there's a direct correlation? Well, you know, that needs more study, but it certainly is grabbing people's attention right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Don, again, thank you. I know we went a little bit different direction than our normal long term weather forecast looking out two, three weeks. But this is information that does affect our weather on a long term basis. And so I thought it would be good for you to share that with our listeners here as well. So thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Glad to be here. And again, that was meteorologist Don Day. If you'd like to track along with what he does on a daily basis, you can go to his website at dayweather.com. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to put a wrap on this week's episode. When we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Well, before we head out, I did want to add to a comment that the captain had talked about earlier when he was referring to the latest issue of Working Ranch Magazine, the November-December issue. And something I want to add to that is we're headed right smack into the heavy bull sale time of the year and for the next few months. And if you want one place that you can turn to to find a lot of information on those bull sales, well, turn no further than your Working Ranch Magazine. And if you don't have your subscription today, you can get it started at workingranchmag.com. Well, if you'd like to get a hold of me, my email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. The Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine. I'm your host, Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.